You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get out, Get the point. Good. And now... Bend over. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. I'd like to teach the world to sing, but I don't have that many buckets. (laughs) Oh, my Lord, yeah. (laughs) There's an awful lot of us out there that, yeah, even if we had a bucket. (laughs) Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, Channel 10. Also on the RLM TuneIn radio station, the RLM Internet radio station, also the RLM Spreaker channel. And yeah, if you are listening in over on the Spreaker channel, please be so kind as to come on over to RealLibertyMedia.com. Think of a nickname, join the chat, because quite frankly, I have crap internet. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, this is winging and prayer in here, you know, and one wing here, put your left wing in, you put your left wing out. Okay, let's move along. I need to find the hokey pokey. <laughs> That's pretty much what all this election shit is. Hokey pokey. They do the hokey pokey. It's hokey. And you're poking, and you're poking, you're you're colored in a circle, or you're poking Chad, or whatever Chad did. I don't know, but yeah. Moving along. So let me go say hi to everybody before I get started on this craziness, because it is a wacka 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 doodle Wednesday, and it's kind of burzy out here in Grammy Land. Just kinda. Oh man, I just got plastered with a snowball. <laughs> Someone just sent me a snowball fight. Mmm, why I oughta. Damn kids. Kids these days, I swear. Uh, yes. Duck, get it. Get the duck. Dun dun dun. I befriended a duck. <laughs> quack, quack, waddle, waddle, quack, quack, waddle, waddle. Ooh, I got 66 ducks. Philip, 66. Okay, moving along. Hi. <laughs> over here on Twitter, thank you ever so much, Barman, for tweeting me out. Also, hey there to BB. How are you doing, hon? And looky there, QT Anon is wanting to know, who is the most intelligent person in the Democratic Party? Seriously? <laughs> you don't have a nunya. Or a nota. None of the above. There ain't one. They're all pretty much flatliners. Sorry. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, yeah, I've been, I actually started following Q over here as well. Just, you know, for shits and giggles. Because it's like, what the hell? What the hell? I, I obviously can't sing. And I'm on the radio, so I can't tap dance right now. Because I'd hurt myself and probably break my computer. But moving along. Okay. Mm, There's Twomples Dilskin. Hi, Twomples. Yeah. And, and who is it? Uh... Jim Acosta, yeah, he kept getting told, no, shut up, that's enough, and then they tried to take the microphone away, and he wouldn't give it up, because why, because he's a three-year-old, and he says, no, no, I want to, no, no, yeah, okay, honey, that's just fine, you you just be a petulant child, we'll let you, uh, moving along, because he's an excellent example of a petulant child, don't you know, so, Hi, everybody over on Twitter. How you doing? Hope you're doing absolutely amazing. Uh, Let me see. Over here on realliberty.org. Thank you, Grim, for letting everybody know that, yeah, I am live right now on Real Liberty Media, Channel 10, and lots of other places. And it's kind of scary. Kind of scary. But you know what, peeps? You hear me on the radio, and you you got to go, shit, if she can do it, anybody can. That's the whole point behind this. I kind of got rooked into this years ago, you know, because I wanted to, I said, oh, sure, you know, I got lots of music on my computer. I'll play some music. And then I got told, you need to do a talk show. (laughs) I think they pretty much figured out that I don't know how to shut up sometimes, most of the time. Okay, when I'm sleeping. But, oh, hi. 
Thank you. Yes, thank you for reminding me that I need to shut down. Hi, Tom Wirtz over there on Fakey Book. I see you, and I also see Darwin is over there. Hey, Darwin. How you doing, hon? Let's see. So, okay. Over here on realliberty.org. Grimner's here. Ro uh, Bob Renner is here. Lovely Psycholo. Hi, Psycholo. <coughs> Excuse me. Rob Works is also over here as well as Flasher. Flasher! And Bobby Bain. Hey, Bobby. Are you still working your ass off, hon? Good God. He is the hardest working man I know. Seriously. Good Lord Almighty. Um... Oh, <laughs> Tom's being a smart ass. I shared something uh, a little bit ago, and Goober actually agreed with it because I put it in the chat as well. Uh, you are what you eat, so don't be fast, cheap, and easy or fake. Faker, faker, belly acre. And, well, Tom just had to let me know, uh, you know, I think we should define fast. Because you can grab an apple from the Amish on my way to wherever. So, yeah, he must be pretty fast. And he's easy and cheap, too. Well, Tom, I'm proud of you. <laughs> I ain't easy, but I can be tricked. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay, what else? Yeah, there's Darwin. And Pamela. Hi, Pamela. How are you guys doing? Okay, moving along. Over here on Mines. Hey there, everybody over here on Mines. I'm seeing all kinds of fun stuff over here. And, yeah, I shared something, and some big old meanie poo-poo head rained on my parade. <laughs> oh, killing children in a war is legal. Growing a plant to cure cancer is illegal. I think it's time humanity started looking at what is right as opposed to what's legal. Yeah, because pretty much everything that Hitler did was legal, too. So, yeah, we don't need no legal schmeagle. Ha, yo, Flasher, I see you. Uh, back to saying, where was I at? Okay, that's on mines. Yeah, that's a good one. I think I'll have to, I think I'll have to share that one over in the, that's a good meme. I, I don't, I don't like it, but I like it, you know? Okay, moving along. La, la, la. Okay. So I've been to Mines, I've been to realliberty.org, I've been to Fakey Book. Let's go check out freedomsnetwork.com, that effing site. Once again, Grim is being an overachiever and letting everybody know that I am live and in poison over here on this effing site. I also see that Mujuter was also on for a while, as well as the lovely Estrella and Loki Luck. Also, yay, uh, blacks voted Democrat last night. Wow. Okay. That's something that KD Troxel shared over here on this effing site. I didn't. I just, I, yeah, I just didn't. I'm tired of it. Okay. Um. Ooh. <laughs> Tom is being very, very naughty. Okay, shout out to Yada Fufa. Huh. Okay. I guess now it's time for me to come on over to where y'all need to be if you want to give me some static, don't you know? Over here in the reallibertymedia.com chat. Or you can also be over here in the red pill chat too if you if you know if you are so inclined. Um cuz yeah, I'll say hey to everybody over here as well. But in the RLM chat, I see right up top, Mr. Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. Why? Because he lets everybody know that I'm on, and that makes him splendiferous. I also see Grimner, who is the RLM god, don't you know, as well as the lovely Moose Girl is here, and the lovely Kate. Hi, Kate. How's things in Florida? I'll bet you you're a lot warmer than I am. Chow Sedoni is also here, as well as the lovely Cycles. Hey, Cycles. <laughs> I just love Cycles. She's so awesome. I also see Chloe is here as well as Chloe the hippie. Ah, hippie as in being a hippie with the beads and the long hair and all that fun stuff, or hippie as in big hips. <clears throat> we'll just move along. D underscore C is also here as well as Echelon. And look, there's a flash somebody here. He's going to flash somebody. I just know he is. Beetle, what are you sharing? 
I ain't cheering, cheering. This I'm swearing. What the hell is that? I just got to see. Oh, woo. Wow. So is that like, um, is that solar radiation shit? Or is that, what is that, Beetle? Is that the sun? Or is that earthquake data? I listened to a Corey Good video yesterday, and he said that the sun is getting ready to shift into the fourth density. I don't know. Stranger things could happen. I needed a sip of coffee. Okay, let me back to where am I? Yeah, I'm here, as well as I be Don C. Looky there, Meisterbrower is also here, as well as a double dose of pox going on in the chat box. Poxified and poxophone is in here. Pompa Pompa Ponsauce is here, as well as a lovely rain. RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel, is here, as well as Rob Woikes. Where's the bubbler, Rob? Free advice of the day. Don't pick a loser when you go out to vote. Well, that's why I didn't. That makes you a loser. I would have had to spend gas money to drive into town to do that. And it's like, they ain't worth it. You know, when you have a choice between dumb and dumber, or their choice and their choice, hippie, Chloe, as in being very hippie. I know people that are hippie. <laughs> and then I know hippies. So, just... Just saying. Um, moving along. Moving along. Where's my bubbler, Rob? Bubbler? Uh, and here I thought we're asked to all be nice. That is being nice. It's just being silliness, girlfriend. Jeez. Okay, moving along. Um, or maybe I'm just being overly sensitive. That could very well be, too. Hmm. Hi, Skittles. Oh, and Rome's is here. Hi, Rome's. I forgot you, but then I saw you. So, hi, Rome's and Skittles and Woodman. See, we got a double dose going on there. The Phantom is also here, as well as Asmo2 and Beetle and Chalsa Denis. Um, that's right, Grim. It means you got you got a swing on your back porch. There you go. Um, Colfax 101 is also here as well as Cyborg Noodle. May you be touched by a Cyborgian noodliness. And Dakota. Hi, Fwumpy. I see you, Fwumpy. Gromit is also here as well as Java, 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 Java Doctor 2. And looky there, JJ's at Scottish Filler is also here as well as Kozu and Van Meter. Hi, Donna. How are you? Let's see who is over in the red pill that's different from over in the in the RLM. Let's see. Beth Z is also over here. And F. Canella and Juan Ataco and KD Troxel and QFTW and Soily. He's feeling mighty Soily. Oh, and Apostle is also here. Hi, Apostle. So, see, all kind of people are in the cheater chatters. Um,. Oh, man, I, I, t I got to tell you, Chloe, I mean, I don't, my hips are just big enough, but uh, they fit me. <laughs> In any case, um, on a treadmill, oh, cripes, you kick that treadmill up a couple of notches, and I definitely got a swing going on my back porch, which is why I don't go real fast on treadmills. Besides the fact that I'm not necessarily the most coordinated person in the world. And I have been, I am so glad they have those sidebars. <laughs> or I would be a video on YouTube. Just saying. Face plant. Face plant. Oh, you're tired of it all. You know what? I'm tired of it all as well. Um, Java over here in the the red pill but yeah um <clears throat> that's why there's an awful lot of times where i just kind of ignore what that's true flash they will make everyone smile and if you kick up that treadmill a little bit too high then the girls get a little unruly as well which is why i don't go that fast on <laughs> Good one, Donna. Okay, moving along. Let's go see what do I have. What do I have today to get into trouble? You know, I'm going to get into trouble. I always do. Brother Fudd. Yes, it is dark out. I am so glad we have gone back to standard time. I absolutely detest daylight savings time. Detest it. My body just is just all wonky. 
you know, with that daylight savings time stuff. When it goes back to standard time, which is the time I'm used to getting up, then then everything is right with the world. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, what? <laughs> okay. Oh, it's the Schumann Resonance. Thank you, Beetle. Okay. That's Earth's electric mag electromagnetic field spectrum. How awesome is that? Oh, and the white. Ooh, okay. Moving along. Okay, now I found all kinds of fun things on Twitter. And then I kind of, yeah. I may have to close Twitter just because it's like, really? Seriously? Oh, my God. There's Barman letting people know that, yeah, I'm live. <laughs> And there's Jabberwocky, that JJ feller over there. Okay, dun dun dun. Let me see. Okay, I've checked all my notifications. Now I need to. Which one do I want to go with first? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I have so many choices here. You know for. Wow, I think I'll just go with this one first because this is one that I was like, really? Wow, finally, something something that actually kind of grabbed my eyeballs. Uh, from IntelliHub.com, Jeff Sessions is out and Matthew Whitaker becomes new acting attorney general. Note they said acting because they're all acting. Some of them are just worse actors than others. But Matthew Whitaker has become the new acting attorney general after Jeff, Jeff Sessions resigned from his post on Wednesday following months of harsh, harsh criticism by Trumpel Stilskin. Wow, I didn't pay any attention to the harsh criticism because, well, okay, I don't pay attention to that kind of stuff. I wonder, see, stop and think here for a minute. Everything has a monetary value. You're paying attention. I don't wish to spend my time on their nonsense, but this one piqued my interest. So, apparently Jeff Sessions resigned on Wednesday after being pressured by Trumpel Stilskin for more than a year over his decision to recuse himself from the Robert Mueller-led Russian probe. Yeah, they're probing Russians. I don't know that I'd want to do that. You shouldn't probe Russians. I think they're tougher than we are. Don't go there. But Sessions' recusal put Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein in the driver's seat over the entire probe, but Rosenstein has failed to act on the pointless wit witch hunt. Now we shall see what new acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker can muster. Muster. <laughs> That's such a fun word. But... POTUS Trumpel Stilskin tweeted a two-part tweet on Wednesday which read, We are pleased to announce that Matthew G. Whitaker, Chief of Staff to Attorney General Jeff Sessions at the Department of Justice, will become the new Acting Attorney General of the United States. He will serve our country well. We thanked Attorney General Jeff Sessions for his service and wished him well. A permanent replacement will be nominated at a later date. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. So, in other words, it's a little bit of rearranging going on, you know, little distraction here, little distraction there. Uh, from what I understand, the, um, uh, oh, yay, I am glad you're doing excellent, sweetheart. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> Squirrel. Oh my God, I am such a total squirrel. Oh yeah, that's what it was. Um, I read that, that the demon craps got the house and the Rebloodlicans got the Senate. You know, it sounds like a divorce agreement, doesn't it? Not necessarily a nice divorce agreement, but still a divorce agreement. So, um... Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, the Russian thing is total BS. I got to agree, Q. It is, yeah, nonsense. But, you know, there's also a link off to the side that I thought, oh, wow, that is really cool. And I will get to it here in just a minute. But first, I have got to go. I've got to go with this one. And it's from The Onion. Paying homage. 
<laughs> now, it is dated May the 31st of this year. But it's the news in brief. An inconsolable Jeff Sessions tries to commit suicide by smoking a joint. Apparently, Washington, following months of bruising criticism from demon craps and POTUS Trump will still skin alike, an inconsolable Jeff Sessions was reportedly trying to commit suicide Thursday by smoking a joint. Hmm. Now, I swore I'd never take the coward's way out, but what choice do I have, said the teary-eyed Session, carefully laying a sealed envelope containing his farewell note on a tool bench in his garage as he raised a lighter to the marijuana cigarette with his trembling hands. <laughs> this is it. I've taken four puffs to make sure there's no chance of survival. It should only be a matter of minutes now. Oh, what a wretched and ignominious ending. Goodbye, cruel world. I'm sorry I failed you. <laughs> At press time, Sessions reportedly realized he died after being overcome by a euphoric floating feeling. <laughs> And that's probably why he voted Democrat. <laughs> uh, what is that? Okay. Wow, there's all kind of Sessions things on the bottom of this. Like um, a sullen Jeff Sessions scrolls through minority incarceration statistics to cheer self up. I could see that happening, too. Or how about this? He drops a pile of weapons in prison yard before ordering inmates to reduce overcrowding by 30%. Well, that would do it. And Sessions also rattles a baton along prison bars in a speech vowing to crack down on violent crime. You just, you do that. Yeah. He, you know, he, wow. Just looking at him, he looks like a mousy little feller. <laughs> And I just think, oh, my Lord, darling, you just, wow, seriously, they put you there. I am sad for you. Um, I had to do that onion one, though. I just had to. <laughs> Even though it's it's old, it's still timely. You know, some things just remain timely. Uh, what is this? Okay. Texas House member wins re-election from a jail cell. <laughs> That's funny. I don't care who you are. You know, I have read times where dead people actually won because they were a better option than the live ones. Which, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. You know what? I've been forgetting to share my links. Shame on me. I so naughty. There we go. Okay. Wow, that's a freaking long ass link. I hate when that happens. Damn it. You know that euphoric feeling probably would be one of those, oh my god, I'm dying. Okay, let me put this over here on the effing site. And then I also need to share my previous link over here. Because I'm a slacker. Yoo-hoo! Okay. Where's the, where's the doobie doobie? There's the doobie doobie dude. I love these emoticons, Grim. I really do. Rally, I do. Okay. Shit. Shit, two's eight farts fraction. There. That's the one I wanted. And then I'll go back to. Okay. You know, seeing as how I've covered the... Oh, I have so, one more elec election selection. You need to... I need to keep remembering to put that S on the front. Because, you know, they gave they give you these choices to choose from. And, oh, whoa, Nelly, Talk about choices to choose from. Let's see. Do I want a wish in one hand and shit in the other? Oh, wait a minute. It's a wish biscuit. And it smells funny. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah. <sighs> you know, when when the game is rigged, why bother playing? Ugh. 
Okay. I see a flasher going on. Access denied. Uh, what's that? Oh, a dead guy won yesterday? <laughs> Thanks, Grim. <laughs> I think I'll open that one. <laughs> Uh, Y'all think it really can it matters? <laughs> see? See? Oh, man. See, si, see, si, nor. Okay. Oh, good God. Cortez. Damn, girlfriend. And buggy eyes are just wrong. I just, wow. Okay. Uh, go ahead and close Twitter because, yeah. Okay, where's the other one? There was one other one that I wanted to... Where's that at? Mm. Nope, that's not it. I had one. I had one. Okay, okay. Let's go with this crazy one until I find it. I know it's it's across the top somewhere along here. Because um, I... I opened it and I went oh hey oh hey there it is I found it okay in any case from faux yeah you know I had to pull one of those up well Bobby Bain shared it in any case it said yeah those demon craps they have won the house but behind Pelosi's soaring rhetoric is this harsh political reality it's so harsh harsh so <clears throat> as word trickled out Tuesday that uh, dem demon craps had recaptured the house. You know, it's like a game of Stratego. <laughs> yeah, the likely demon crapic speaker, San Fran Nan Pelosi, the Botox biatch from California, wasted no time in celebrating the moment. I did see that little boogaloo thing that she did too. Wow, my eyes. Ow. Yes, tomorrow will be a new day in America, she proclaimed. You know what, sweetheart? I got a news flash for you. Every day when you wake up, it's a new day. <laughs> and, and, wait for it, there's more. It's changed from yesterday. Yeah, I know. It's kind of freaky deaky like that. But, <clears throat> beyond Pelosi's soaring rhetoric is a harsh political reality. The power to shape the country no longer rests in the House. Why? Because the Senate won that in the divorce. <laughs> Instead of the waning influence of America's legislature, it's concentrated in the Senate. And unless demon craps can take back the upper chamber... Ah, see, now they're called chambers. So, you know, and a chamber pot, y'all know what a chamber pot is, don't you? <laughs> so, if you're in the upper chamber, <laughs> then it rolls downhill. <laughs> Tuesday's victory is nothing but a political fool's gold. That's right. Yeah, what's rolling down at you, that ain't gold. <laughs> it's not a chocolate bar either. Apparently, here's why, at least according to this op-ed. Most Americans know how D.C. works. Yeah, that cesspool. And, is, and they know how it's supposed to work. With the House and Senate drafting compromise legislation to fix the nation's troubles, while the popo signs or vetoes the bills accordingly. Okay, that's how things are supposed to work. But, you know, that's what we were told. Yeah. Apparently, a recent study shows that things aren't going as the Founding Fathers had planned. <laughs> what was your first clue? No longer are the House and Senate serving their intended functions of drafting new laws, declaring war, and serving as a check on the po-po. Yeah, the potus, maybe, because popo is police. Potus. There we go. Instead of uh, the deeply divided legislative branch has delegated its powers to the executive, specifically to the POTUS and his many executive orders. Well, you know, and I asked someone who was my representative, quote unquote representative, back in the day when, you know, actually it was not too long after I got off of the city council. He came for a town hall meeting and I asked him, so what's the deal here? Why are you letting uh, Obama, and that's pretty much the way I said it too. I, I did not say president. I just said, why are you letting Obama write 
executive orders that create laws. That's not what executive orders are intended to do. Executive orders are supposed to stipulate how existing law is to be executed, how it is to be carried out, who is supposed to be doing what. It's not supposed to create law. So why are you letting the POTUS get away with this shit? And he said, well, you know, they've been doing it this way for years. And I said, that doesn't make it any less wrong. And you know what? He never did answer my question. He just went on to the next person. Huh. I was shocked. Not. Not. But there was an awful lot of other people that there was a lot of mumbling going on after that. And I had several people ask me, why would you ask that question? Because I want to know. That's not the, you know, he's supposed to be a constitutionalist. Yeah. And yet he's not following it. So I called him out on it. In any case, back to this. It's a pattern that started with President Barack Obama. No, it didn't. It started way before that and has continued under POTUS Trumpelstilskin. But that heavy-handed governing has led to an unending stream of lawsuits from opposing states and activist groups. That means that the federal judiciary has more frequently stepped in to decide the nation's future on the most divisive issues like abortion and immigration and affirmative action. Affirmative action. I love how they call that affirmative action because there's nothing positive about it and an affirmation is a positive thing or it's supposed to be maybe i'm understanding that wrong hmm. in effect we're increasingly governed not by the house and the senate but by a partisan judge who rule on partisan lawsuits you think that's anything new that crap was going on before the ink was dry on the constitution now, the legislature is impotent, thundered Senator Ben Sasse, who's, is that how you say it? It's Sasse. He's from Nebraska, just north of me, you know, where everybody's corn fed. And that was during a recent debate, um, and he said that the legislature is weak. Oh, they are very weak. They don't even read the crap they write. You've got to pass it before you read it. How moronic is that? And yet they did it. <clears throat> yeah, even as Capitol Hill has weakened itself, the Senate has retained one critical function, confirming those many judicial nominees who rule on those many partisan lawsuits. From the Supreme Court to the Federal Circuit Courts, America's senators are choosing the elite group that has dictated and will continue to dictate the nation's future. They take dictation. Or are they dictators? Now, none of this is to say that the House is wholly without power. Oh, no, they're real good at, at being bombastic. Those demon craps <clears throat> will almost certainly use their majority to launch investigations of Trumples and the Rebloodlicans. In other words, they're going to do a whole bunch of nothing. <laughs> you want to see the circus? I'll elect some clowns. There, you got a circus every day. Oh, they're even going to, might even start impeachment talks against the POTUS. You know what? Y'all impeached um, Slick Willie. Nothing changed. Nothing. You know, it's, that's like telling a three-year-old, if you don't stop doing that, I'm gonna, and then don't carry out on it. That's what's going on. Yeah, but make no mistake, governing power now sits in the Senate vis-a-vis -vis the judiciary. No, governing power doesn't sit in any of those places. Unfortunately for the demon craps, that's incredibly bad news. <gasps> On Tuesday, Rebloodlicans added to their once slim Senate majority with what will likely be five new seats when the final votes are counted. But make no mistake... Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky will put that additional firepower to work. Sure he will. Mm -hmm. He and his colleagues have already confirmed Justice Niles Gorsuch, is that, or Neil, Neil, yeah, pfft. read what's written, Grammy, that helps a bunch. <laughs> Justice Neil 
Gorsuch. Is that how you say that? I have no freaking clue. And Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court bench with a clear eye on replacing the aging Ginsburg and and Breyer. See, I didn't even know that, that there was such person on the SCOTUS. Hmm. Additionally, Republicans will continue adding to the already impressive 29 circuit court judges confirming that confirmed during Trump's first two years. That's a record for any modern POTUS. So smart demon craps are bitterly aware of this development, with a minority recently lashing out at McConnell for pushing through judicial nominees while the Senate was technically in recess. Y'all are always on recess, playing on the monkey bars, playing in the sandbox, playing on the tilt... The, the uh, merry-go-round. Yeah, here we go, round and round and round. How many of you get tossed off when that bad boy gets to spinning really fast? It's not like it's going to make a difference for any of you. Still, ever hopeful demon craps are crossing their fingers that the 2020 Senate elections might give them a shot at retaking the upper chamber. Oh, that way you guys will be doing your own defecation from the upper chamber, and then it'll trickle down to the lower chamber, who will not be real pleased with getting what you are sharing from the upper chamber pot. <sighs> I'm bored with this. <laughs> I mean, I can only do faux news for so long before it's like, okay, I'm bored with this. It's yada yada, blada blada, yeah. Uh, oh, good one, Flasher. I like that. Take my advice. I don't use it anyway. I rarely use my own advice either. Um, dun dun. <laughs> craziness craziness i tell you okay let me put this over here on the effing site i'll 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 do my catch up over on realliberty.org later because i have way cool emoticons over here on on the effing site just saying san fran nan what a she's a piece of work that's all there is to it Okay, let's see. Uh, what other one do I want to use? I got to find a... Where do... I scrolled fast it. I hate that. There. Okay. Now. To the link that Grimmy shared in the chit chat. Dead Rebloodlican brothel owner wins selection in Nevada. <laughs> 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 oh, what just went through my head? He's a stiff one. <laughs> okay. Apparently a brothel-owning evangelical Christian-backed Rebloodlican candidate who died last month won his race for the Nevada State Legislature late on Tuesday. That's according to the state selection officials. Wow. <laughs> A brothel-owning, evangelical, Christian-backed Rebloodlican. You don't see one of those very often, do you? Dennis Hoff, 72, defeated the demon crappic uh, candidate and educator uh, Lysia Romanov in the race for Nevada's 36th Assembly District, earning about 68% of the vote. <laughs> Now, county officials said that they would appoint a replacement candidate for the same party for his seat. Well, isn't that just special? You better find someone that's just as special as he was. I got to tell you, you don't see a brothel owning evangelical Christian factory blood the clean every day. Now, <clears throat> Hoff, who presented himself as an American pimp, was a strip club owner who ran multiple brothels, and he had nicknamed himself the uh, Trump from Parump. <laughs> yeah, that's after the town where he lived in Nevada, Parump. Oh, that's a fun, that would be fun to say, I'm from Parump. 
Now, in in a June interview with Reuters on Moonlight Bunny Ranch, his brothel near his home in Pahrump, Nevada, Hoff said that his political fortunes had parallels with those of POTUS Trumpelstilskin. This really is the Trump movement. Hoff said, and people will set aside for a moment their moral beliefs, their religious beliefs, to get somebody that is honest in office. You know, it really is kind of refreshing to hear some rather abrupt honesty, even, yeah, even if it's still, you know, stringing a line. I mean, they they really believe what they're saying. Of course, a lot of them really believe what they're saying. So, uh, Chuck Muth, who is Hoff's campaign manager, was one of the many who predicted last month that Hoff would win, stating that Republicans had a two-to-one advantage over Democrats in the state assembly district in terms of voter registration. Now, I know Republicans in Nevada got massacred tonight, but my man Dennis Hoff crushed his opponent from the great beyond in AD 20 or 36 and we crushed the anti-brothel initiative in Lyon County by about 80 percent. Wow. Now friends found him dead when they went to wake him for a meeting hours after his 72nd birthday party. Wow he went out in style let me tell you. Um, And he said that Hoff appeared to have died in his sleep. Well you know okay. The thrice divorced author of Art of the Pimp, who appears on CB or on HBO's Cat House, owned a strip club and five legal brothels in Nevada. It's the only US state with legalized prostitution. How funny. That really is very funny. Thank you, Grim, for the chuckle. <laughs> Although I find m- much of this amusing as hell anyway. So yeah, because, you know, it, I mean, I get angry with some of this stuff, but then I just have to laugh at it because it's like, wow, seriously, <laughs> this is just crazy, crazy, I tell you. Okay, let me find it. Let me find a chuckly guy. Yeah, we'll do that guy. So. Praise the Lord and pass the hookers. You know, he must have been a Pastafarian. He must have been. Because um, <clears throat> they believe that heaven has volcanoes that spew beer and wenches that are always serving the beer. And yeah, so maybe he was a Pastafarian. I don't know. Maybe he just said he was evangelical to get the votes. You know, them politicians. Um, oh, I, I hear you, Chloe. Yeah. The leader of the Oompa Loompas is not necessarily, but Hey, it is pretty funny. Um, dun, dun, dun. Ah, coffee. Coffee, 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 coffee. Or as Java would say, Java, 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 Java. Now, back to... Okay, do I want to do... Okay. Uh, Do I want to go there or do I want to go... Here we go. This one's from... Um, Aeon.co, it's an essay, How the Internet Flips Elections and Alters Our Thoughts. Now, I don't know that I will read the whole thing, but it's by Robert Epstein, by the way. Over the past century, more than a few great writers have expressed concern about humanity's future. In The Iron Heel, 1908, the American writer Jack London pictured a world in which a handful of wealthy corporate titans, the oligarchs, kept the masses at bay with a brutal combination of rewards and punishments. Much of humanity lived in virtual slavery. Hmm. 
while the fortunate ones were bought off with decent wages that allowed them to live comfortably, but without any real control over their lives. Wow, does that sound... Hmm. In We, 1924, the brilliant Russian writer um, Yevgeny uh, Zamyatin, I know Circles is going to laugh about that one, anticipating the excesses of the emerging Soviet Union, he envisioned the world in which people were kept in check through pervasive monitoring. The walls of their home were made of clear glass, so everything they did could be observed. Oh, that's just creepy. And they were allowed to lower their shades an hour a day to have sex. But both the rendezvous time and the lover had to be registered first with the state. Oh, wow. I am, wow. Wow, that's just messed. <laughs> In A Brave New World in 1932, the British author Aldous Huxley pictured a near-perfect society in which unhappiness and aggression had been engineered out of humanity through a combination of genetic engineering and psychological conditioning. And in the much darker novel, 1984, written in 1949, Huxley's compatriot... George Orwell described a society in which thought itself was controlled. In Orwell's world, children were taught to use a simplified form of English called newspeak in order to assure that they could never express ideas that were dangerous to society. Now these are all fictional tales to be sure. And in each, the leaders who held the power use uh, conspicuous forms of control that at least a few people actively resisted and occasionally overcame. But in the nonfiction bestseller, The Hidden Persuaders, in 1957, recent re re recently released in a 50th anniversary edition, the American journalist Vance Packard excuse me, described a strange and rather exotic type of influence that was rapidly emerging in the United States and that was, in a way, more threatening than the fictional types of control pictured in the novels. According to Packard, U.S. corporate executives and politicians were beginning to use subtle and, in many cases, completely undetectable methods to change people's thinking, emotions, and behavior based on insights from psychiatry and the social sciences. Yeah, it's called PR companies. I think it was Freud's nephew, actually, that was one of the pioneers of that. Now, most of us, I could be wrong on that, but most of us have heard of at least one of these methods, you know, the subliminal stimulation, or what Packard called sub-threshold effects and the presentation of short messages that tell us what to do, but that are flashed so briefly that we aren't aware we've seen them. In 1958, propelled by public concern about the theater in New Jersey that had supposedly hidden messages in a movie to increase ice cream sales, the National Association of Broadcasters, the association that sets standards for U.S. tell -lie vision amended its code to prohibit the use of subliminal messages in broadcasting. In 1974, the Federal Communications Commission opined that the use of such messages was contrary to the public interest. And legislation to prohibit subliminal messaging was also introduced in the U.S. Congress but never enacted. Both the UK and Australia have strict laws prohibiting it. Like, that's going to keep... Okay, I got to throw this out there. You know, all you people that say, but there's laws. You know, criminals don't give a shit about gun laws. And if you turn in your guns, and I know there's an awful... I have weapons. We'll just leave it at that. But if they make them illegal to own then I will, just by virtue of them putting squiggles and lines on paper 
and saying that it's a law by virtue of that law i will instantly become a criminal because i ain't turning them in kiss my ass so you know laws prohibiting don't mean doodly squat back to this article Subliminal stimulation is probably still in wide use in the U.S., and it's hard to detect, after all, and uh, no one is keeping track of it. But it's probably not worth worrying about. <laughs> right. Research suggests that it's only a small impact. Yeah, who paid for the research? And that it mainly influences people who are already motivated to follow its dictates. You know, subliminal directives to drink affect people only if they're already thirsty. Uh-huh. That's your story and you're sticking to it. Uh-huh. Now, Packard had uncovered a much bigger problem, however. Namely, that powerful corporations were con constantly looking for, and in many cases already applying, a wide variety of techniques for controlling people without their knowledge. He described a kind of cabal in which marketers worked closely with social scientists to determine, among other things, how to get people to buy things that they didn't need and how to condition young children to be good little consumers. They live. Inclinations that were, that were explicitly nurtured and trained in Huxley's Brave New World, yeah, guided by social science, marketers were quickly learning how to play upon people's insecurities and their frailties, their unconscious fears, their aggressive feelings, and sexual desires to alter their thinking, emotions, and behavior without any awareness that they were being manipulated. By the early 1950s, Packard said, politicians had got the message and were beginning to merchandise themselves using the same subtle forces being used to sell soap. Packard prefaced his chapter on politics with the unsettling quote from a British economist, Kenneth Boulding. A world of unseen dictatorship is conceivable, still using the forms of democratic government. Could this really happen? And if so, how would it work? Well, I'm about to tell you. So, as soon as I scroll down a little bit, the forces that Packard described have become more pervasive over the decades. The soothing music we hear over her, overhead in the supermarkets, they cause us to walk more slowly and buy more food, whether we need it or not. That's it. Earplugs when I go grocery shopping. <laughs> Most of the vacuous thoughts and intense feelings our teenagers experience from morning till night are carefully orchestrated by highly skilled marketing professionals working in our fashion and entertainment industries. Politicians work with a wide range of consultants who test every aspect of what the politicians do in order to sway votes. That's got to be the only way San Fran Nan and Barbara Boxer and Maxine Waters get elected. Man, they've got to have an awful lot of Yes, master. Jeez. Oh, how about their clothing and their intonations, their facial expressions, which San Fran Nan has very few of left because the Botox has killed the nerves. Uh, makeup and hairstyles and speeches are all optimized, just like the packaging of a breakfast cereal. Oh my, those Wheaties sure are sexy. <laughs> I don't think so. Fortunately, all of these sources of influence operate competitively. And some of the persuaders want us to buy or believe one thing, others to buy or believe something else. It is the competitive nature of our society that keeps us, on balance, relatively free. Relative, wow. Relatively free. Define relatively. 
But what would happen if new sources of control began to emerge that had little or no competition? And what if new means of control were developed that were far more powerful and far more invisible than, oh, let's say, any that have existed in the past? What if new types of control allowed a handful of people to exert enormous influence, not just over the citizens of the USA, but over most of the people on Earth? <clears throat> might surprise you to hear this, but these things have already happened. Because Google decides which web pages to include in search results and how to rank them. How it does so is one of the best kept secrets in the world, like the formula for Coca-Cola. So to understand how the new form of mind control works, we need to start by looking at the search engine, and one in particular the biggest and best of them all, namely Google. I don't know that I would go that far. I like my duck duck go. But <clears throat> to carry on with this, the Google search engine is so good and so popular that the company's name is now a commonly used verb in languages around the world. To Google something is to look it up on a Google search engine. And that, in fact, is how most computer users worldwide get most of their information about just about everything these days. They Google it. Google is, all, is so good at giving us exactly the information we're looking for, almost instantly and almost always in the first position of the list um, that it shows us after we launch our search, the list of search results. And that ordered list is so good, in fact, that about 50% of our clicks go to the top two items. And more than 90% of our clicks go to the 10 items listed on the first page of the results. Few people look at other result pages, even though they often number in the thousands, which means they probably contain lots of good information. But Google decides which of the billions of web pages it is going to include in its search results. And it also decides how to rank them. How it decides these things is a deep, dark secret. It's an ancient Google secret. Yeah, it's one of the best kept secrets in the world. Like the formula for Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, I don't like Coca-Cola anyway. Now, because people are far more likely to read and click on higher ranked items, companies now spend billions of dollars every year trying to trick Google's search algorithm. So see, it's got a secondary um, businesses building up on it. You know, just like the IRS, if we were to get rid of the IRS right now, look at all of the secondary businesses that have been built up around the IRS. Yeah, talk about a crash. All those CPAs without work. Man. But back to this. Um, the computer program that does the selecting and ranking is that algorithm. And um, trick it into boosting them another notch or two. Moving up a notch can mean the difference between success and failure for a business. And moving into the top slots can be the key to fat profits. Now, in late 2012, this author began wondering whether highly ranked search results could be impacting more than consumer choices. Perhaps, I speculated, a top um, search result could be a small impact on people's opinions about things. Early in 2013, with my associate Ronald E. Robertson of the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology, in Vista, California, I put this idea to the test by conducting an experiment in which 102 people from the San Diego area were randomly assigned to one of three groups. In one group, people saw search results that favored one political candidate. 
That is, the results that linked to web pages that made this candidate look better than his or her opponent. In a second group, people saw search rankings that favored the opposing candidate. And in the third group, the control group, people saw a mix of rankings that favored neither candidate. The same search results and web pages were used in each group. The only thing that differed for the three groups was the order of the search results. So to make our experiment realistic, we used real search results that linked to real web pages. We also used a real election, the 2010 election of the Prime Minister of Australia. And we used a foreign election to make sure that our participants were undecided. Now their lack of familiarity with the candidate assured this. So through advertisements, we also recruited an ethnically diverse group of registered voters over a wide age range in order to match key demographic characteristics of the U.S. voting population. Out, Traskel, your claws hurt. Now all participants were given, first given brief descriptions of the candidate and then asked to rate them in various ways, as well as to indicate which candidate they would vote for. So as you might expect, participants initially favored neither candidate on any of the five measures we used, and the vote was evenly split in all three groups. Then the participants were given up to 15 minutes in which to conduct an online search using Kadoodle, our mock search engine, which gave them access to five pages of search results that linked to web pages. Now people move freely between the search results and web pages just as we do when using Google. And when participants completed their search, we asked them to rate the candidates again. We also asked them again who they would vote for. And we predicted that the opinions and voting preference of 2 and 3 percent of the people in the two bias groups and the groups in which the people were seeking or seeing rankings favoring one candidate would shift toward that candidate. What we actually found was astonishing. The proportion of people favoring the search engine's top ranked candidate increased by 48.4 percent. And all five of our measures shifted toward that candidate. What's more, 75 percent of the people in the bias groups seem to have been completely unaware that they were viewing biased search re, uh, rankings. And in the control group, opinions did not shift significantly. Now this seemed to be a major discovery. The shift we had produced, which we called the search engine manipulation effect, or SEAM, appeared to be one of the largest behavioral effects ever discovered. And we did not immediately uncork the champagne bottle. For one thing, we had tested only a small group of people, and they were all from the San Diego area. So over the next year or so, we replicated our findings three more times, and the third time was with a sample of more than 2,000 people from all 50 states. Now in that experiment, the shift in voting preferences was 37.1 percent and even higher in some demographic groups, as high as 80 percent in fact. We also learned in this series of experiments that by reducing the bias just slightly on the first page of search results, specifically by including one search item that favored the other candidate in the third or fourth position of the results, we could mask our manipulation so that few or even no people were aware that they were seeing biased rankings. We could still produce dramatic shifts in voting preferences, but we could do so invisibly. Still no champagne though, because our results were strong and consistent, but our experiments all involved a foreign election that 2010 election in Australia. So could voting preferences be shifted by real voters in the middle of a real campaign? Well, we were skeptical. 
in real elections, people are bombarded with multiple sources of information. And they also know a lot about the candidates. Seemed unlikely that a single experience on a search engine would have much impact on their voting preference. So to find out, in early 2014, we went to India, just before voting began in the largest democratic election in the world. And Lok Sabha, Sabha um, election for the Lok Sabha election for prime minister. Now the three main candidates, I can't pronounce their names, so I'm just not even gonna. Uh, making use of an online subject pools and both online and print advertisements, we recruited 2,150 people from 27 of India's 35 states and territories. Got them to participate in the experiment. To take part, they had to be registered voters who had not yet voted and who were still undecided about how they would vote. So unlike subliminal stimuli, Seem has an enormous impact, like Casper the Ghost pushing you down a flight of stairs. The participants were randomly assigned to three search engine groups, favoring respectively the uh, different people running. And as one might expect, familiarity levels with the candidates was high, between 7.7 .7 and 8.5 on a scale of 10. Now we predicted that our manipulation would produce a very small effect, if any, but that's not what we found. On average, we were able to shift the proportion of people favoring any given candidate by more than 20% overall, and more than 60% in some demographic groups. Even more disturbing, 99.5% of our participants showed no awareness that they were viewing biased search rankings. In other words, that they were being manipulated. Seems near invisibility is curious indeed. And it means that when people, including you and me, are looking at biased search rankings, they look just fine. So if right now you Google U.S. presidential candidates, the search results you see will probably look fairly random, even if they happen to favor one candidate. Even I have trouble detecting bias in search rankings that I know to be biased because they were prepared by my staff. Yet our randomized, controlled experiments tell us over and over again that when higher ranked items connect with web pages that favor one candidate, this has a dramatic impact on the opinions of undecided voters. In large part for the simple reason that people tend to click only on higher ranked items. Guilty! I'm guilty of that. Now this is truly scary. <clears throat> like subliminal stimuli, seem as a force that you can't see. But unlike subliminal stimuli, it has an enormous impact. It's Casper the Ghost pushing you down a flight of stairs. Now we published a detailed report about our first five experiments on seem in the prestigious Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in August of 2015. And we had indeed found something important, especially given Google's dominance over search. Now Google has a near monopoly on internet searches in the US with 83% of Americans specifying Google as the search engine that they most often use. That's according to the Pew Research Center. So if Google favors one candidate in a selection, its impact on undecided voters could easily decide the selection's outcome. So keep in mind that we had had only one shot at our participants. What would be the impact of favoring one candidate in search pe searches people are conducting over a period of weeks or months before a selection? It would almost certainly be much larger than what we were seeing in our experiments. So, 
other types of influence during the selection campaign are balanced by competing sources of influence. A wide variety of newspapers, radio shows, television networks. But Google, for all intents and purposes, has no competition. And people trust its search results implicitly. Assuming that the company's mysterious search algorithm is entirely objective and unbiased. Now this high level of trust combined with the lack of competition puts Google in a unique position to impact elections. Even more disturbing, the search ranking business is entirely unregulated. So Google could favor any candidate it likes without violating any laws. And some courts have even ruled that Google's right to rank order search results as it pleases is protected as a form of free speech. Now this goes on and on about Google's bias itself. But yeah, that that's a little something. I'm going to let you guys finish reading this on your own. That's just a little something to let you know that yeah, even me that thinks that possibly, you know, oh no, I'm just I'm doing a search and yeah, they're not messing with me, which is pretty much why I I do Grammy, am I not here? What the hey? I'm showing, I'm streaming, hon. See, this is what happens when I don't pay attention to the, I get involved in a, hmm. Okay, Chloe can hear it. Okay. And there, ta-da! Okay. I was worried. Holy smokes. Okay. That was kind of a, you know, and it's one of those things that when you stop and think about it, it's like, yeah, that just makes total sense. But once again, I do use DuckDuckGo. Um, I don't like Google. I don't like Bing. I don't like, I like my DuckDuckGo. Um, you know, what's the other ones? Quaint. Quaint's another one that I've had, I've had people tell me, you ought to try using Quaint, but yeah, I just, I like DuckDuckGo. So, okay. Let me find, uh, okay, we'll do that. Hmm. Now back to, that is kind of freaky deaky that they have. And you know, I've, the advertising and all, and yeah, look at a lot of things now. And you know, like S-E-X is spelled out in the clouds and all kind of other shit, which I know the human mind wishes to create order out of chaos. And so sometimes it sees things that Maybe it wasn't intentionally put there. Maybe it was. I remember years and years ago, people saying, there's pornographic stuff hidden in Disney movies. And I poo-pooed it until I saw one. And then it was like, oh, shite. Because <laughs> once you see it, you can't unsee it. And then you start seeing it everywhere. You know, it's kind of like once you've taken that pill... There is no going back, Neo. So, yeah. Um. Oh, Grammy. Um. I was gone for a while. Okay. Sorry, honey. Uh. Hmm. What is this? Oh, good God. <laughs> I just checked out what Java Doctor posted over in the red pill. And yeah, that Minds link, that's funny, Java. <laughs> okay, back to, back to, where did I want to go? So see, now you're getting, now you're getting controlled. And see, this, this is where I'm seeing, okay, I wonder if the order of these things over on IntelliHub 
because I have a tendency to scroll towards things that in any case this is canola oil is destroying your heart even if it's organic yeah canola oil is bad juju now canola oil is a popular food ingredient used mostly for frying and baking that doesn't belong on anyone's plate or in any snack bags it's an ingredient not meant for human consumption and shouldn't be in any preppers pantries Yet this cooking oil is touted as a healthy alternative to saturated fats. Sadly, most health food stores are soaked in this oil. And nope, it's not the new enemy of mainstream coconut oil. Um, so we are talking about canola oil. Now, canola oil is the darling of the medical community, the fast food industry, the big food, and sadly, even health advocates. Not only is canola a genetically engineered crop, but it's known to be sprayed with glyphosate, the active ingredient in Monsanto's toxic weed killer. And as, that's as a pre-harvest desiccant. That is that glyphosate formula to dry crops faster for harvest. But even if canola crops weren't sprayed with glyphosate, it would still be far too toxic to eat. Even if it weren't a GE food, you would, you'd want to banish it from your diet forever. So here's why you should banish canola. Canola oil is like battery acid to your heart. There's no such thing as a canola plant or seed per se. It's actually a variety of rapeseed that was man-made. And the name is actually an acronym, CAN-O-LA. It stands for Canada Oil Low or um, uric, yeah, it's low in acid. E-R-U-C-I-C. -I, I cannot pronounce that. I'm not going to try. Now, another source says that Ola, part of the name, is based on uh, similar oils like Mazzola brand, which is maize oil. Chances are, people are more likely to trust something called canola versus its actual name, rapeseed. Now, like other vegetable oils, it's not really based from a vegetable because it comes from a plant seed. Now, according to the Canola Council, canola is the world's only made-in-Canada crop, and it was developed by researchers from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and the University of Manitoba in the 1970s using traditional plant breeding techniques. Now, in the mid-1990s, the plant was genetically engineered to withstand glyphosate herbicide. Now, if something is able to withstand a poison, imagine what it's doing when it gets inside your body. So, when you look on the ingredient list to see organic canola oil, that means the oil was derived from a, spe a specially bred rapeseed but not the newer GMO variety. Now, although modern rapeseed, the canola breed, was specifically bred to be lower in um, euric, euric acid, however you say that, it's 2%, you should know that this oil was found to create heart lesions in animal studies. Yet this oil is constantly touted as heart healthy. The industry says that this lower acid profile is safe. But do you believe them? Well, consider this. Now that the oil is one of the most popular oils to use in most packaged goods, fast food, and restaurants, people are now subject to more of this acid than ever due to the cumulative food choices. The oil is promoted as a healthy alternative to other oils and animal fats because it has omega-3 fatty acids and a small study claimed that it lowered LDL which is the bad kind of cholesterol. But this doesn't mean that it's a healthy product. Another health claim is that it is not a hydrogenated oil. 
But as you will see, the oil is subjected to lots of processing and multiple chemical baths, and the oil itself is considered a dietary driver of inflammation. Now, a Harvard expert who believes canola oil is safe notes that the benefits of the oil are gone during the heat processing and constant frying. The trans fat content is increased through frying. So, not just in the world, but in the developed world and in the United States, heart disease remains the number one killer. And it's the number one premature cause of death. Now, I'm not going to say that vegetable oils correlate with more heart disease, but it is safe to say that government health campaigns that pushed vegetable oils over animal fats, palm oil, and coconut oil did not drastically cut cardiovascular death numbers. So, look around. They aren't shutting down cardiovascular units, they're building more. So we should pay attention to research that says this ingredient makes cardiovascular problems worse. Fatty, placky heart, anyone? Yeah. So let's put it a little bit of perspective here. The amount of um, erisic acid in modern canola oil by weight is 2%. So that's just above the least amount of that acid that the researchers used on rats for 112 days. And yes, the rats were presumably overfed on this stuff. But notice their comment. Very slight accumulation of fat droplets in myocardial fibers in fats fed rapeseed oil containing 1.6 percent of that um, erisic acid. Now, is that supposed to be reassuring? It only took a few months for them to develop heart lesions on the same amount of acid that is in the oil most Americans are consuming now. And this oil is now the, in most food products. That means that if I eat a bevy of foods containing modern canola oil over a lifetime, why wouldn't I at least develop very slight heart abnormalities? See how the media presentation is manipulated? They take the above information to mean safe. But rational people can clearly see that the study has proved a danger. And yeah, Snopes can get away with saying canola isn't harmful if consumers, or if consumed the regular way, but yeah, Snopes, seriously? Less does not equal better. Less acid, less of this acid does not equal heart healthy. Yeah, uh-huh. So repeat after me, their idea of safe is false. Shame on the American Heart Association and the Mayo Clinic for their endorsement of canola. And according to Natasha Longo, on withdrawing the canola oil from their diets, the deposits dissolved, but scar tissue remained on all vital organs. So to get an idea of other ways in which canola is inflammatory, it's best to go to the source of how it's processed by watching the show How It's Made. And in that segment on YouTube, you can see that canola oil is wrought through the following steps. Uh, seeds are harvested from pods after the flowers die off. Chaff and other plant material is separated from the seeds. Plant material is used for animal feed. Seeds enter a roller mill that crush them into thin flakes. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. It gives you all the breakdown. I'm sure you can read that if you wish to. Bleach is injected in and... Uh, or they're bleached and then injected with steam heating process to remove any odor. Yummy! I thought bleach bottles said not meant for internal consumption. Now it really is quite a process and obviously not something that would happen naturally or with the ancient oil press. Unfortunately, a lot of our olive oil is fake also because it, it may be cut with canola oil. And that means that extra virgin olive oil that you think is heart healthy may actually be rancid cardiovascular nightmare. 
Canola oil has a shelf life of one year. Have you ever smelled olive oil after it's been on the shelf for a while and got kicked in the face with something that smelled like wood varnish? Yeah. So, what oil should you be using instead? Well, for heating, sauteing, frying, and baking, co uh, coconut oil, or peanut oil, or avocado oil, or ghee, or lard, or butter are better than canola oil. For salads, dressings, and marinades, you have olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil, walnut oil, and hemp seed oil. And you might also consider air frying or broth sauteing and using avocado smash or nut butters instead of commercial oils. Since most oils are processed and refined and we can't always be sure of what we're getting. So, what you need to do is avoid fast food, restaurants that use and reuse cheap oils, margarine, stay away from margarine, shortening, I haven't used margarine or shortening for years, snack foods, which is nearly all chips, crackers, and baked goods, canned and packaged goods like salad dressing, mayo, and soup that contain canola, and check every single food that comes from a health store. And you know what? I got something that, that I thought was really, really healthy. They're um, little fig bars. Um, only they're like blueberry and raspberry and fig and all that other fun stuff. And I was reading the ingredients on them. Canola oil. I was really bummer dooted when I saw that. Really bummer dooted. So... If you're eating a baked or fried snack, try to get ones that use coconut oil, avocado oil, or lard. Sunflower oil is not a good oil for snack foods since high heat is used. And I cannot stress enough, the independent research is catching up on the detrimental health effects of so-called vegetable oils. But chances are your doctor hasn't. It takes a long time for this information to reach critical mass. So every time you say no to a french fry, you are saying yes to something good in your life. That you care about what you want to be around long enough to enjoy. So, I'm giving the finger to establishment food. How about you? Yeah, I, I actually had some canola oil in my pantry and you know what I used it for? I used it for... Um, oiling a, some wood that was really, really dry. <laughs> you know, because I, I didn't have any um, linseed oil around. So I used that. It worked. So, yeah. Okay. Moving along. Let me get this shared over here. Um, yes, um, dun, dun, dun. yeah, canola oil is very, very bad, Beetle. You don't want to go there. Not at all. I basically, I have peanut oil, I have olive oil, and I have coconut oil. But I also have almond oil that, um, basically is a topical kind of thing, because almond oil is very good for the skin. And I also have jojoba oil that I do not use for cooking. That's also for skin or for blending my essential oils. And let's see, what's the other one? I have another one. Uh, grapeseed oil that I use for blending my essential oils. Because some people can't do... Um, there you go, Grim, with peanut oil. And you know what? My brother fries his turkeys with peanut oil for Thanksgiving. Ooh. Wow, I did not know that, Beetle. I didn't know it killed ants. Damn, that's some nasty-ass stuff now, let me tell you. So, do not go there. And people are starting to catch up on that. You know, there's, they're starting to catch on that canola is not necessarily... A good thing so yeah I'm glad people are starting to figure that out 
apparently not fast enough, but, but they are starting to figure it out. Wow, it's that late already. I need to go check out the pig, and I didn't get to half of the things that I had set aside. Darn it all. And yes, coconut oil is good. No matter, I know there's an awful lot of things that are coming out and saying that, that coconut oil is bad for you and it's, it's harmful and it's, uh, yeah, no, it's not. Coconut oil is good. Hell, I make my own toothpaste with coconut oil. It's very good for your teeth. Teeth and tissue, which I actually got someone else that's going to, um, I, she'd never heard of essential, well, she'd heard of essential oils, but hadn't really, you know, talked to anyone that had used them. And while I was at work, she had come in, um, and she'd asked for some salt th so she can make her, a uh, a warm salt swish because she had a tooth that was bothering her. And I said, oh, ooh, okay. So, well, I got her some salt in a cup and, I said, you want to try some oils on that? And she kind of looked at me and I said, just let me see your finger. And I put just a drop of melaleuca, which is tea tree oil, on um, on her finger. And I said, now rub that around your tooth, on the tissue around the tooth, and uh, see if that doesn't help just a little bit, you know, and see if that helps along with your salt water rinse, your warm salt water rinse. And she and I sat there and we jibber jabbered for a while. And about five minutes later, when she finally decided to go back to her room, she said, you know, my tooth doesn't hurt anymore. I'm going to save this warm salt rinse for just in case. <laughs> but I told her, yeah, clove oil works great too, which I need to. She will still be there in the morning and I have to go into work in the morning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give her a little sample bottle of some melaleuca oil and some clove oil and if nothing else to get her until she gets home so that you know and then she can get in to see the dentist but if it's relieving what's going on you know or alleviating some of it then hey you know and I know when I have sensitive tooth issues but I also told her I asked her you know um, she said something about her it felt like her enamel was starting to flake off and I said what kind of toothpaste are you using which she's using Sensodyne and I said, I bet it's got fluoride in it, don't it? And she said, probably. And I said, you know, if you can tell because it'll probably say on the back, um, if harmful, if swallowed. And if swallowed, contact the poison control hotline, which a lot of people don't realize that swallowing is the least of your worries when it comes to fluoridated toothpaste. Because um, think of it like this. You know, people that are having a heart attack, when they give them the nitroglycerin pill, they have them put it under their tongue because it gets absorbed into the system faster. Well, guess what? That fluoride that's in that toothpaste doesn't make shit and a difference if you swallow it or not because it's getting absorbed in your tissue, in the gingiva and underneath your tongue. So, just saying, you're already getting it in your system. So you don't wanna go there. So I told her how to make her own toothpaste as well. <laughs> And then I gave her my website for my oils so that she can, if she wishes to, she can go and order some. But, <clears throat> yeah, bless her heart. In any case, now that I've prattled on about that, let's go over and check out the pig, shall we? I have to, you guys know, I got I to gotta tout my oils every chance I get. I absolutely love them. They're, they're nature's medicine cabinet. They're, they're just supplements, basically, to help your body fix itself. It's not like a cure or anything like that. It's just something that gives you supplements, chemicals that you're in nature that your body needs in order to repair itself because your body's designed to do that. So, okay, now, over here on the pig, the word of the day is blue wave. It's a jackass party political deluge that washes away our prosperity, sovereignty, and inalienable individual liberty. That must be a hamboism, I'm thinking. In the quotable quotes section, 
it's probably too late for places like New York City and California. They might as well be communist countries. The rest of America still has hope, but only so long as we continue to weaken the totalitarian yearnings of those on the left. Oh, honey, there's totalitarian yearnings of those on the right as well. Those that say my way or the highway are totalitarian yearnings. So, just saying. But that was Dr. Hurd. Uh... Okay, let's go check out this date in history. The 7th of November, 1637, Cranky Cross cultists can't find their turn the other cheek and banish Anne Hutchinson as a heretic. Ooh. This date in history, the 7th of November, 1805, trailblazers Lewis and Clark finally view the Pacific Ocean. And finally, this date in history, the 7th of November, 1874, cartoonist Nast is first to depict Republicans with elephant symbol. Ah, and it's gone downhill ever since. Now, in there, what was this? Okay. Um, in the tasty tidbit section, I got to do this. It's a great lesson on stress. A young lady confidently walked around the room with a raised glass of water while leading a seminar and explaining stress management to her audience. Everyone knew she was going to ask the ultimate question, half empty or half full? She fold them all. How heavy is this glass of water? Well, answers called out ranged from 8 ounces to 20 ounces. And she replied, the absolute weight doesn't matter. It depends on how long I hold it. If I hold it for a minute, that's not a problem. If I hold it for an hour, I'll have an ache in my right arm. If I hold it for a day, you'll have to call an ambulance. In each case, it's the same weight, but the longer I hold it, the heavier it becomes. And that's the way it is with stress. If we carry our burdens all the time, sooner or later, as the burden becomes increasingly heavy, we won't be able to carry on. So as with the glass of water, you have to put it down for a while and rest before holding it again. When we're refreshed, we can carry on with the burden. Holding stress longer than um, longer and better each time practiced. So, as early in the evening as you can, put all of your burdens down. Don't carry them through the evening and into the night. Pick them up again tomorrow if you must. So, number one, accept the fact that some days you're the pigeon and some days you're the statue. Number two, always keep your words soft and sweet, just in case you have to eat them. Number three, always read stuff that will make you smile or make you look good if you die in the middle of it. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Number four, drive carefully. It's not only cars that can be recalled by their maker. Mm, wow, hadn't thought of that one. Nobody really knows when their warranty runs out. Number, number five, if you can't be kind, at least have the decency to be vague. <laughs> number six, if you lend somebody $20 and never see that person again, it was probably worth it. Number seven, it may be that your sole purpose in life is simply to serve as a warning to others. I, I've met quite a few people like that, and I've told people for years that my purpose in life is comic relief. Sometimes people laugh because I'm genuinely funny, and sometimes they laugh because it's like, thank God that's not me. <laughs> 
Number eight, never buy a car that you can't push. <laughs> That's, well, oh, I am so busted on that one. Number nine, never put both feet in your mouth at the same time because then you won't have a leg to stand on. Number 10, nobody cares if you can't dance well. Just get up and dance. There you go. Number 11, since it's the early worm that gets eaten by the bird, sleep late. I wish I could do that. Number 12, the second mouse gets the cheese. That is true. Unless you have one of those sticky traps. I caught a mouse in one of those the other day. <sighs> Number 13, when everything's coming your way, you're in the wrong lane. <laughs> <laughs> Number 14, birthdays are good for you. The more you have, the longer you live. Number 15, some mistakes are just too much fun to make only once. Uh, then it's not a mistake, it's a bad habit. <laughs> Number 16, we could learn a lot from crayons. Some are sharp, some are pretty, and some are dull. Some have weird names and all are different colors, but they all have to live in the same box. Yup. And just because they're broken doesn't mean they're no longer, no longer have a purpose. Okay. Number 17, a truly happy person is one who can enjoy the scenery on a detour. Oh my God, I've taken the scenic route so many times and I just got to laugh when I'm going through it. And finally, number 18, have an awesome day and know that someone has thought about you today. Now here's another one. Why parents drink? <clears throat> the pig is full of them today. A father passing by his, son bedroom, his son's bedroom was astonished to see that his bed was nicely made and everything was picked up. Then he saw an envelope propped up prominently on the pillow that was addressed to Dad. With the worst premonition, he opened the envelope with trembling hands and read the letter. Dear Dad, it is with great regret and sorrow that I'm writing you. I had to elope with my new girlfriend because I wanted to avoid the scene with Mom and you. I have been finding real passion with Stacy, and she is so nice. But I know you would not approve of her because of all of her piercings, tattoos, tight motorcycle clothes, and the fact that she is much older than I am. But it's not only the passion, Dad. She's pregnant. Stacy said that we will be very happy. She owns a trailer in the woods and has a stack of firewood for the whole winter. And we share a dream of having many more children. Stacy has opened my eyes to the fact that marijuana doesn't really hurt anyone. We'll be growing it for ourselves and trading it with other people that live nearby for cocaine and ecstasy. In the meantime, we will pray that science will find a cure for AIDS so Stacy can get better, because she deserves it. Don't worry, Dad. I'm 15 and I know how to take care of myself. Someday, I'm sure that we will be back to visit so that you can get to know your grandchildren. Love your son, John. P.S. Dad, none of the above is true. I'm over at Tommy's house. I just wanted to remind you that there are worse things in life than a report card that's in the center desk drawer. I love you. Call me when it's safe to come home. <laughs> oh, those little shits. Children, 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 you just, sometimes you just got to drop kick them. That's over on PIGazette.com, by the way. So those of you who wish to come on over and check it out, say hey to Hambo and Porkus. They also have a new top story over here on the home page. And there's all kinds of other links all throughout. So come on over to PIGazette.com. Let's see what's going on here. Um... Oh, people are popping in and out. Wee-ha. Okay. 
Okay, where was that? Bad enough that... Okay. Now, let's see. What was one of the other ones that I wanted to get to? I don't want to do that one now. <laughs> I had several of them pulled up, but now I don't want to go there. Um, okay. I think I saw this over on the effing site. It's from Reason.com. Long time no see is considered offensive, non-inclusive language at Colorado State University. Really? Hmm. Well, at Colorado State University, the administrators have designated the common greeting, long time no see, as non-inclusive language. That's according to a student, Katrina L uh, Leiby, who wrote for the campus paper, the Rocky Mountain Collegian. Now, she met with Zara Al Saloum, Director of Diversity and Inclusion at CSU. They really have a Director of Diversity and Inclusion? God, how messed up is that? And um, showed her a list of terms and phrases considered contrary to the university's mission of fostering inclusion. If you want to foster inclusion, then you should include all of that stuff. Dipstick. Now, one of these phrases was long time no see, which is viewed as derogatory towards those with an Asian accent. <laughs> really? Leiby also noted that administrators discouraged use of you guys in favor of y'all. Really? Gonna make everybody go Texan, huh? Y'all? Well, okay, I say it too. Which is a gender neutral and ungrammatical but this is apparently less of concern. Now, her column does not claim that administrators force students to use the gender-neutral term terminology, just that such terminology is preferred. Now, Al Saloum did not respond to her, a request for a comment. The College Fixes Jennifer Cabany says that this is an example of campus political correctness run amok. I'm having a hard time disagreeing. I can't imagine anyone reading racial subtext, subtext into long time no see. I'm thinking the biggest racist is the one that's seeing racial subtext in that. Oh wait, unless they have already been instructed to look for it. Now the greetings Wikipedia page raises the possibi possibility that it is of Chinese or Native American origin, but an NPR article from 2014 says the phrase is so widespread that it's impossible to tell for sure. It's no wonder that policing microaggressions might actually backfire. As some research has shown, many people who are supposedly impugned by a given slight fail to register it as offensive. What is to be gained by insisting that they should find it offensive and that people who persist in using the term are aggressing against them in some small way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, long time no see. I, I'm having a hard time seeing that as being any kind of racial slur. I say that all the time to people that I haven't seen in a long time. Duh. Totally dippity doo dah. Oh well. It is getting close to the end of my time. So I guess yesterday, Flash Rooney had In a Perfect World, and I forgot to announce that it was going to be on on Tuesdays at nooner, at least nooner my time. Um, let's see. I will be back on Friday for the Freaker Friday edition of The Rocket Chair. I don't think there's anything else, because I think Vinny is still on hiatus. Um, not positive, but I think, yeah. Wait, I need this one and this one and yeah. Where's that other one? 
Another one. There we go with the brain sucker. That's the one I need. Oy. Okay. Do I have one more quickie? One more quickie. Hmm. Um, there it is. I knew I had it. I knew I did. I had it in my pocket. And it's really, 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 really long. So I'm not going to get to it. But it's how to hack a selection from GQ.com. Um, what's that? How long is that one? Okay, this is, this is a quickie. <laughs> it's from World Econ Economic Forum dot com or dot org. We forum dot org. This coding could be the end of air conditioning. Oh, uh? so cranking up your air conditioner by the way this was from September of this year uh, if you're cranking up your air conditioner in the summer heat might seem like a good idea but it's not a great idea for the planet or for your electric bill now researchers from Columbia University have devised an alternative to air conditioning that could keep your home cool without se um, sending your power bill sky high it's a white polymer that reflects more than 96% of sunlight, and it becomes a dyeable paint-like form, meaning that it could be used to coat the sides of the roofs on, of your house to keep them cooler when the sun is at its strongest. Now, the researchers described the coating in the paper published Thursday in the journal Science, and to create it, they engineered a mixture that forces water to settle into tiny droplets in the polymer. When those droplets evaporate, they leave tiny air holes behind. And the holes, the researchers say, are what give the coating its remarkable sunlight-reflecting property. The researchers put their concoction to the test under the oppressive heat of Phoenix, Arizona, that is oppressive heat, painting it onto a copper sheet attached to um, sensors to measure the temperature. And after 30 minutes, they found that the coating was 6 degrees Celsius, or 10.8 degrees Fahrenheit, cooler than the ambient temperature. That means it might not be long before we're slathering the stuff on our homes in order to ward off the summer heat without cranking the AC. Now, um, the world is only getting hotter as we deal with the repercussions of, here we go, climate change. <laughs> climate changes. Yeah, that's what it does. And until we transition fully to renewables, using electricity to cool our homes will only exacerbate the problem. Which, yes, a lot of people say, oh, well, we need to have electric cars and all that other fun stuff. What do you think they use for generating all that electricity? You know, they're still using oil, if for nothing else, as a lubricant or diesel to fuel the power plant engines or to make components. Yeah, you're not really saving a whole hell of a lot. So, additionally... Not everyone can use their air conditioning. So think of people in low-income regions or places without electricity, and for those folks, this cheap, easy-to-implement way to lower temperatures could really be a lifesaver. And yeah, it could be. That is kind of cool to have a paint that would do that. Now let's hope it's non-toxic as well. So, okay. Yeah, I know, I hear, but it's a dry heat, so it's a different heat. Grimmy, I have um, been to Phoenix, <laughs> and when Mother and I went to uh, go shopping, she had potholders in her car to that we used to not only open the car doors, but also close the car doors, and to also open store doors. Yeah. It's freaking hot down there. Dry heat just made it feel even more hot. <laughs> so, 
Um, let's see. Dun, dun, dun. That is a pretty neat article, though. So, oh, yeah, there you go, Beetle. We need a climate change tax. Yes, we do. Yes, we do, because, you know, climate change. <laughs> climate changes and I do have an article but I'm not going to get to it today um, that has to do with they found out that their numbers were wrong oops but I'll have to get to that on Friday if I remember <laughs> In any case, thank you all for listening in. I think I'm going to go ahead and get out of here because I, I do have some stuff I need to get tended to this evening. So, y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your whack a whack a whack a whack a whack a doodle Wednesday evening or Thursday morning or whatever day it is that you listen to this. And uh, I will catch y'all in the funny papers. But until then, please remember, I truly do. Love you all, and I wish you all enough. Good night. <laughs>